Amen. So do you have your one? Who is the one that you're going to share Jesus with and encourage in their relationship with God? And who is the one that does not know God yet that you could lead to Christ? I'm going to keep it in front of you. I want you to challenge me as I challenge you. I want you to encourage me as I encourage you. I want you to pray for me as I pray for you. Look around you for a moment. Just take a moment. Go ahead and look around. It's okay. Go ahead and look around. Look at all the people in this room. I bet there's over 200 people in this room today. And if I'm right, imagine what would happen if each individual person was to lead someone to Christ and next week brought them here. That would mean we would have 400 people sitting in this room. Hello. Isn't that cool? And all you have to do is talk to one. Who's your one? That's what discipleship is. I am so passionate about discipleship. It was years ago that God first woke me up. It was years ago that God first helped me understand what discipleship is. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has taught us in the first four weeks of we looking at discipleship and answering the question, what does it really mean? Jesus showed us that discipleship is not a program. You will never hear me say that, and you will never hear the leaders of this church say that, because it is ministry and it is life. It is not a program. It is something you cannot turn on and you cannot turn off. It is something you choose to do every day of your life. Jesus made that abundantly clear. So clear that Jesus said, if you're not willing to sacrifice everything for me, you're not worthy of me. He put it this way. If you're not willing to bear your cross, you are not worthy to follow me. Hello. Our Savior gets in our face and He challenges us with love and He challenges us with truth. We looked at Peter, and Peter helped us understand some questions that we need to be able to answer. Three of them that I pose, four of them, I'll just bring up three right now. One is, is Jesus changing your life? Is Jesus changing your life? Look back six months, maybe 12 if you need to go back 12. But if you're wrestling with the same issues that you were wrestling with at six months and 12 months before, ladies and gentlemen, you are not a disciple of Jesus who's walking effectively for Jesus. And then we looked at the first church in the book of Acts, and we saw them unified, coming together. It was life to them to be together in fellowship and to disciple each other, to be under the teaching of the apostles as they taught them from God's Word. It was life to them to go out and to tell people in Jerusalem who Jesus was and that He loved them, He wanted a relationship with them, and He didn't want them to die without God. God exploded the church from 120 in one sermon to 3,100 in another sermon to 5,000 in a few more sermons, to over 10,000 people in a matter of weeks. Imagine what God would do with us, through us, if we were to live that way. In the last few weeks, we talked about being radical. We serve a radical God who demands radical obedience, who wants radical love according to the radical principles of His Holy Word. Are you radically following Jesus Christ as a disciple of His who is making disciples? That's radical. Satan doesn't want us to be radical. Satan wants us to be neutral. He doesn't want us to be engaged. He wants us to put it in park. Are you a disciple of Jesus who is making disciples of other men and women? Today we're going to look at another layer of what it means to be a disciple. As we continue to look at a life of discipleship and as we continue to answer the question, what does that really mean? Take your Bibles out with me and turn to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. And I want you to go to chapter 15. An amazing book full of doctrine and theology and principles on how to walk with God. This was an amazing church. It was perhaps the most biblically centered, Christ-driven church of all the churches in the New Testament. The church of Rome was probably the most spiritually mature. 
So if you're able this morning, I'm going to ask you if you would to please stand with me as we read some verses. I'll read for you if you'll follow. Romans 15, we're going to pick it up in verse 14. But I want you to remember that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will live forever. Let's look at it together. Verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus in the gospel or in the, to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that, I have to pause here, Paul has long sentences, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have risen to be proud, reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Would you pray with me? Father, the book that we hold in our hands this morning, the book that you have authored, we are so humbled and so privileged to be able to hold it, to be able to read it. Almost every home represented here today has three, four, five, six, eight Bibles in their home. We are so blessed in America, in the land of the free. Help us to return to the principles of your word so we can experience freedom anew. Jesus, you are the focus of Scripture. You commanded us to place you first and to walk in such radical love that people could hear a radical gospel and be radically impacted by your truth. Holy Spirit, you are the leader of God's church, and you are the leader of Kathleen Baptist. And so as the leader of the church, I ask you now to speak. These men and women have not come here to listen to a tall drink of water talk about something for the next few minutes. Instead, they have come to hear a word from you, and so I give you the microphone. The stage is yours. Would you speak? In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There are four things that I want to show you in these eight verses, I believe, that will help you. They certainly are helping me. I've entitled this message, A Disciple's Ambition. And here's the question I want to ask you. Are you ambitious for God? Are you ambitious for Jesus? A disciple's ambition in this Text, I want you to see a man named Paul who was a role model of what discipleship truly looks like. This guy was a stud. This guy was a giant in the faith. This man loved God, and anyone who spent five minutes with him could see how passionate he was about Jesus. Is that you? So as we look at a disciple's ambition, the first thing I want you to see is partner in ministry. Are you partnering with Jesus in the biblical gospel ministry? Go to Romans 1, Romans chapter 1. I hope you have your Bibles now because we're going to look at several passages. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul is writing to this amazing church in Rome in a decadent, idolatry-driven, centered, uh, evil-centered city. We find this godly church, Paul says to them, as he writes this letter, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The first thing I want you to see in this verse is that Paul identifies himself to the Roman church as a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look in the Greek, the word servant really in the English is a bad or a poor translation. What is really here is the Greek word doulos. Paul is saying to the church in Greek, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Are you a slave to Jesus? 
Paul says, he is called by Jesus Christ to be an apostle. He is telling them that he has apostolic authority from Jesus Christ himself. He was commissioned by Jesus, sent out by Jesus, and he's a slave to the living Savior, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel is the good news of this book. The gospel is the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Savior. The gospel is hard because God's going to challenge you about your sin from this book. So for those of you who have just accepted Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you. You are embarking on a difficult journey. It is not easy, but my goodness, it will be the best thing you've ever done in your life. Be faithful to this book because God's going to call your sin out. He's going to make you look at it. As ugly as it is, he's going to hold it up in front of your face. But the gospel is also love. God will love you and encourage you and build you up and protect you and shudder you. He will help you. You will never be alone. Students, I want to encourage you to remember that. You are never, ever alone as a child of the living God. I want to encourage you, students, as God is encouraging us, be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Go to verse 8 of chapter 1. Paul now begins writing this amazing book. First, Paul says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Did you catch that? The Roman church was a great commission church. They were disciples of Jesus who sought to make disciples and everyone in the Mediterranean world knew that Rome was a church that feared and walked with God. When the city of Lakeland discusses Kathleen Baptist, what do you think they say? I'd love to be a fly on the wall to hear some of the comments. Would they describe us this way? Would they say this about us? That the Spirit in the Gospel is so powerful in our presence that people see Jesus oozing from the pores of our lives. Paul is encouraging the church at Rome a very strong and spiritually mature body of believers. Now return to our text and look at verse 14. Paul says, I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Paul is commending them. He is building them up. They love God, and everyone who comes in contact with them knows it. Look at verse 15. But anytime you see that word starting a sentence, you need to pause. Paul builds them up and he praises them and then he warns them. But don't become complacent, Paul says. On some points I have written to you very boldly by the way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God. He's helping them understand that yes, you guys are doing awesome things, but don't get so relaxed you stop serving Jesus. Don't become complacent. I want to ask you this morning as a disciples ambition is it your ambition to partner with jesus christ in ministry second i want you to see priest of the gospel paul now identifies himself as a priest of the gospel look at verse 16 he says to be a minister of christ jesus to the gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of god so that the offering of the gentiles may be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot there, so let's unpack it. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And I want you to look at verse 1. The writer of the Hebrews, this amazing letter, says this, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Translation, If you want to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus, pour over the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And look at our Savior. He is the great apostle. He is the one who was sent out by God. He was God's messenger to us. And as a child of God, that is what you are. You should be a messenger of the Gospel to people who do not know Jesus. You should be the sent out one, the one that God sends to do his ministry. Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. I want to encourage you with this. Satan will mock you. He will deride you. 
He will slander you. He will make you wish that you were not a child of God. He will try to intimidate you. He will try to stop you from proclaiming the gospel message. But can I tell you something that Satan can't touch? Is it okay if I share it with you? Satan cannot kill or stop your testimony of what God is doing in your life. That is the most powerful instrument you have. Live for Jesus. And when people ask you why, share with them what God is doing in your life. Satan can't stop that. Satan can't prevent that. He can do everything he can to assault your character and to keep you from serving God. But you have a story. It is his story and how he saved you and what he's doing in your life. Proclaim it. Tell it. And you will become so bold in your witness and in your life for God. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Would you say that with me? One God. One God. Don't ever be confused. There's only one. So when you talk to your non-Christian friends who are pursuing other gods, and they ask you why you don't, just tell them, because I serve the God. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. Tell them in the love that you have, I serve the God. What do you mean, the God? If you've noticed, you can have a conversation with people about God, quote-unquote, and have a very civil conversation, a very civil discourse. But the moment you bring Jesus Christ into the conversation, that's when things change. Satan doesn't like it when you do that. The moment you say that Jesus is the Christ and that the only way to go to heaven is by having a relationship with Jesus Christ, that He is the life and He is the truth, and no one can go to heaven except through Him. Now you cross the line. And Satan doesn't like it when you cross the line. I want to encourage you, don't just dip your toes over it. Jump into it. Tell them what they need to hear, that there's only one God. And there's only one mediator between God and man, and His name is Jesus Christ. So Paul is helping the church at Rome. He's reminding them, don't become complacent. Continue to pursue God. Look at verse 16. Paul says he is a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. Translation, he is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. Jews and those who are non-Jews. That's us. Most of us. There may be some Jewish members here today, but most of us are Gentiles. We are not Jewish. So proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people groups. And notice what he says, in the priestly service of the gospel of God. You and I are called to serve Jesus Christ in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Is it your ambition to be that? To live that? Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, were being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Did you get all of that? This is what you and I are called to be as disciples of Jesus. We are called to be living stones. We are called to be a work in progress built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Would you say that with me? Holy priesthood. You're not called to mediocrity. You're not called to be average. You are called to be holy. That will take work. All that you have, you will have to make wise decisions, not poor ones. You will have to make tough decisions, not easy ones. God has called us to be holy. Satan wants us to be mediocre. Because when we're mediocre, we don't tell people about Jesus. But when we're walking in the holiness of God, in the power of the living Holy Spirit, we then boldly proclaim the truth. And so that's what Paul is saying here. Be a priest of the gospel. Is that your ambition? Third, evangelist for God. 
Figuratively, Paul was a priest of the gospel. Literally, Paul was a disciple of Jesus who made disciples. He proclaimed the gospel. He preached the good news. He was an evangelist. And he was a missionary. Oh my goodness, was he ever a missionary. This man could not keep his mouth closed when it came to talking about God. I firmly believe that this man would talk to a tree if he thought that God would save the tree with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, this guy loved God that much. He was radical. There was nothing about Paul that was mediocre. This man was radical. When people see you, do they see the radical presence of a radical God living through your radical obedience on a daily basis? My goodness, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get this right. I hope you are too. Look at verse 17. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. On the surface, it may appear as though Paul is boasting. Look at it closely with me. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work. Paul had a reason to boast about himself, but he never would. He couldn't because he knew he, it was not about him. Go to 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, just the next book over. 1 Corinthians 9, look at verse 16. Paul had this to say, For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul understood he was nothing. Remember how he introduced himself to the church at Rome as a slave of Jesus Christ. He understood he was nothing. Now you have to understand, this man's a lawyer. This man is intelligent, one of the most intelligent Pharisees in the Sanhedrin. This guy was a rising star in religion. He walked away from religion, and he pursued a relationship with Jesus Christ when he met him on the road to Damascus. This guy was a genuine warrior for Jesus. And he says, I can't be proud. I can't boast because it has nothing to do with me. For the necessity of the gospel has been laid upon me. Woe to me if I don't preach it. Don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. I just want to be personal for a moment. When was the last time you led someone to Jesus Christ? When was the last time you led someone to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Has it been a week? A day? A month? A year? There are those in this room this morning who have never led anyone to Jesus Christ. Can I tell you? You can change that today. All you have to do is determine I'm going to be a radical follower of a radical God and I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to surrender radically to His commands and I'm going to live them out. God, I'm asking You to empower me because I'm timid. I'm shy. This is outside of my nature. This is way out of my comfort zone. I'm going to ask You to empower me and to give me the love I need to tell people that you exist and that you love them. Imagine what would happen if every person in this room led someone to Christ today, tomorrow, this week. Paul was an evangelist for God. Verse 18, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Hear this. This is his living testimony. This is his life. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. That's your story. What has Jesus accomplished through you? You share that. You tell that because people need to hear what an average person looked like and then they need to see what a stellar Christian looks like because you surrender to God's leadership. Tell your story. It will change people's lives. It's a beautiful picture Verse 18, look at it with me. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and by deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to 
Elira come, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. There are five things I want you to see here. Five features of a faithful disciple. Number one, there are three of them in verse 18. I'll go through them quickly. Number one, Paul takes no credit for anything God has done. He takes no credit for anything God has done. Neither should you. The moment you start taking credit for what God has done is the moment you will sin heavily against God. This is not about you, and it's not about me. It's not about who we are. It's not about what we do. It is about what God is doing in us and through us. Number two, he preached obedience to God's Word. That's what we need to talk about. What it looks like for an average man and an average woman doing an average job in an average city in suburban America in a small city called Lakeland, Florida. And by the way, your city's not large. It's pretty small. But we are not small in Christ. We are warriors. We are soldiers. We are children of the living God, man, that should put oomph in your step. It should put vigor in your movements. It gives you vitality knowing who you are. Number three, live with integrity. Paul was a man of integrity. No one could doubt. No one could second guess. They all saw his radical obedience to holy God. Verse 19, there are two features here. You see God's divine affirmation upon Paul's life by the power and signs of wonders and the power of the Spirit of God. It was God who did miraculous things through the Apostle Paul. It wasn't Paul. It was God. Number five, Paul evangelized the Mediterranean world with the gospel of God. Look at it with me. Look at the map. I'm going to show you up on the screen. Guys, pop that map up there. See that map? That orange area? I know you can't read the words, but that's okay. Notice the orange area all around the blue area, which is the Mediterranean Sea. Paul carried the gospel to every place you see there in the orange area except Spain. And that was where he was going last before he died. He wanted to go there. He had planned to go there. But if you noticed, Paul carried the gospel to all those places in the orange. Look at what one man did through his obedience to God's calling on his life. Imagine what you could do if you chose to live in radical obedience to the radical commands of a radical God according to His radical Word. It would radically change your life. You like the word radical? Evangelist for God. Number four, a disciple's ambition is a missionary of truth. A missionary of truth. Look at verse 20. I make it my ambition, Paul says, to preach the gospel. What is your ambition? I make it my ambition. The word preach in the Greek means to publicly proclaim, to publicly herald the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named. Notice the ambition he has, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Paul wanted to carry the gospel to everyone who didn't know him. There were some Jews that he went and shared the gospel with. More of them were non-Jews. Paul wanted to go to places that no one had been, carrying the gospel, giving them a message they had never heard. This is the heart of a missionary. He is directly or indirectly responsible for planting 14 churches around the Mediterranean world. Listen to the churches. Ephesus, Corinth, Philippi, Cyprus, Crete, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Smyrna, Laodicea, Pergamum, Syria, Arabia, Sardis, and Rome. One man. One man. Lottie Moon. One woman. Annie Armstrong. One woman. Imagine what God would do through your radical obedience. Picture it. Embrace it. The gospel drove Paul. Does the gospel drive you? Jesus commands us to make disciples. The last thing he said, wherever you go, once you have arrived there, make disciples. 
of all people groups. Whether you know them, whether you do not, make disciples. You see, that's the reason we proclaim the gospel. You want to know why churches are not evangelistic? It's because they don't understand disciples, discipleship. Discipleship drives everything we do in ministry. When we are disciples of Jesus who are making disciples, then evangelism will rise amongst our ranks and more people will begin proclaiming the gospel than just a few. How many times have you heard this? Oh, it's not my gift, but we do have an evangelistic team. The way of the master, give it to them. They'll go. Eh. See, a person who says that, a person who thinks that, doesn't know what Jesus says. But I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to give you a, something I hope it encourages you. You can't run from this. Someone asked me not too long ago, what is Jesus going to hold me accountable for when I see him in heaven? This. Were you a disciple of Jesus who sought to make disciples by proclaiming the gospel, telling people your story, what God has done in your life, leading people to Christ? You know what I, I'm, I'm just, I, I fear, and this motivates me. I don't want my Savior to look at me and say, why didn't you tell him about me? I gave you the opportunity. I even gave it to you twice. Why did you walk away from telling that man or that waitress or whoever it is about me? You and I are going to be accountable for this. You can't run from it. You can't shirk it. You are accountable for the Great Commission. And so am I. We can't run from this. So let's embrace it. Let's step up to the plate. It's not the way of the Master's job, those 17 men and women to go out and proclaim the Gospel. It is our commission. Ours. And if you love Jesus, you'll tell your story. And if you don't, you won't. It's simple. So where are you? Is it your ambition to partner with Jesus in the Gospel ministry? Are you a priest of the Gospel? Are you proclaiming what God is doing in your life to people who don't know Him? Are you a radical evangelist for God? Are you living in radical obedience to a radical command from the radical Word of God in a radical love, walking in radical abandon? Because if you're not, you're not going to do anything that I'm telling you today. But that's your issue. And before you throw a stone at somebody else, Look inside your own house. Missionary of truth. Is that you? Is that me? Today, I want to encourage you to remember the church can be so much more. What's your part? To be a disciple of Jesus who lives in radical obedience to radical God. Is that you? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? There are people in the room today who don't know Jesus. And I'm so thankful you're here. I'm so grateful you came to worship God with us today. This is your moment. God brought you here for me to be able to share with you. You don't have to be alone anymore. I think maybe you understand that there's nothing that's going to fill the void in your life except for Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know Jesus, but He knows you and He wants a relationship with you. That's why He came. That's why He gave up His life. And He died on the cross just for you. He knew you then. He knows you now. And on that third day, our God raised Jesus from the dead. And 40 days later, He ascended into heaven. So my friend, you serve, if you choose, you serve, could serve, a real, living, resurrected God. So here's what you need to do. You need to stop running away from God. And you need to choose to turn around and to run to Him for the first time in your life. 
You need to tell God, I've blown it. I confess to you what I've done in my life. I've hurt people. I've messed things up. God, would you forgive me? I don't want to live this way anymore. By faith, God, even though I don't know you, I'm asking you to be my God. If you'll have me, I'll give you my life for as long as I live. God, would you lead me to a church of men and women who are just like me, who are saved by grace and want to have a relationship with you because I need to know how to live for you. Would you lead me to the people who can help me? My friend, if you'll pray that or something similar to that with all your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, God will save you right now. And you can leave this place a child of God instead of an enemy of God. I'm going to ask you in just a few moments when the group starts singing, I want to ask you to come down and tell me you made a decision for Christ because I would love to celebrate that with you and tell you what comes next. Faith family, are you ambitious? For God, if you haven't led someone to Christ, you can choose to change that right now. You can choose by simply saying, God, I am available to you. I want to live in radical abandon for you. I want to walk in a radical love and obedience to your radical truth. I'm asking you to forgive me for what I've not done, and I'm asking you to empower me for what you want me to do. The check of my life is yours. Would you take me because I want to be like Paul? Like Peter, James, and John, Matthew, and Luke, Annie, Esther, Ruth, the saints of Scripture. Faith family. The only limitations we have are the limitations we place upon ourselves. I'm asking you today to to give everything to God and watch what He will do through us as we do that. And I want you to know, Mary Lou and I are so honored to do life and ministry with you. You guys are awesome. But we have some work to do. This altar will be open for you. You can come up and pray at the altar quietly or you can come up and talk to me and tell me how I can pray for you because I'd love to be able to do that. Don't waste this opportunity. Be radical. Be biblical for Jesus. Father, this is an amazingly sacred moment. As you lead through the Holy Spirit, I pray your people would respond in a way that will make you smile. In your name, Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon from Kathleen Baptist Church. For those that are in our faith family, we hope we can see you again soon. If there is any way we can serve you or pray for you, please contact us at the church office at 863-858-3836. For those not in our faith family, thank you so much for watching today. We would love to connect with you and hear from you to see if there is any way we can pray for you or serve you. We have life groups available for your family to plug into. You can contact us by calling the church office at 863-858-3836 or by going to our website, KathleenBaptist.com. There you can learn more about who we are, find resources for you and your family, see our upcoming events, and watch more of our sermons. We hope you will join us again next week for our service.